So in this uh, series, I'll remind you that what we're doing is looking at uh, legal writing to try to get some tips for how we can maybe sharpen what we're doing with our uh, legal scholarly writing. And in this uh, video, we're going to go to kind of a mid-level review of what a work looks like. So we've, we've done from an introductory place uh, in terms of uh, how we structure a work. Then we went to a, a top level review, looking at it at kind of the Roman numeral level of the piece. Um, and now we're gonna go uh, down to the paragraph level of the piece. And what we wanna see, I'm gonna share uh, a screen with you. What we wanna see here is uh, that each paragraph is doing its job. And whereas in the, in previously, we talked about having a thesis sentence. Uh, well, we talked first about having a thesis that is the beginning of the work, and that's your hypothesis or thesis for the work as a whole. And then we talked about having a thesis sentence at the top of a part of the work, maybe Roman numeral one or Roman numeral one part A. And does that thesis sentence or thesis paragraph control that entire part of the work? Um, now we're going to go actually to the paragraph level. And what we want is paragraphs that start with thesis sentences that are effective. So I'm uh, looking here at a, a brief. I just uh, pulled this because it's a case that's been interesting to me. Um, this is a, a case that was in the Supreme Court last term. It's McKesson versus Doe. Uh, the case was remanded without a decision, without a decision on the merits to the Fifth Circuit in the state of Louisiana. Um, so we don't have a resolution to it, but it's a case essentially in which a police officer who was injured um, in, a, uh, in response to a protest sued a protest organizer, uh, a fellow named uh, DeRay McKesson, who has a big social media following, and accused the uh, McKesson of responsibility in his injury uh, because of uh, McKesson's role as a protest organizer. So there are heavy First Amendment overtones in this case, and there were a number of briefs filed on First Amendment grounds. This one came from some of our top First Amendment and constitutional scholars. Floyd, Floyd Abrams is in there. Uh, Nadine Strawson, of whom I'm a huge fan, is in there also. So I uh, point out that we are here in the United States Supreme Court. We are not in uh, law school seminar. So we would want the quality of writing here to be very, very good. I think that's what we're going to find. And we're also, um, you know, in an area in which people with a First Amendment background tend to uh, also have a writing background. So not terribly surprised that we'll find a high quality here. Um, don't, don't feel that that's daunting. Uh, we all have to work up to this, uh, including me. So uh, we're setting the bar high, but we'll, but even understanding that what we're going to see here should be well done. Um, there's always room to critique, and let's see how well done it is. So I'm diving into the oral, uh, into the argument part of it because, as I say, at this point we're interested uh, in the paragraph level, so I can really go to any part in here. And what I want to look at at the paragraph level are these thesis sentences. So I want to look at uh, the thesis sentence of each paragraph. And I think it's helpful even to underline that thesis sentence. Um, and then I also like to go in and um, personally, I like to circle or some way mark, maybe highlight the subject and verb of each thesis sentence. And maybe if there's a really important uh, subordinate clause, I'll get that too. Um, if it's important to the understanding. So what I have here in this argument at the top, I've got story uh, is, right? In my next paragraph, in recognition of historical and social importance, this court has consistently found or has found, uh, let's go to the next page. Um, now we're into part A, social movements throughout our history have used assembly and demonstration to effect change. Um, so social movements uh, have used. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is a 21st century embodiment of American tradition. So Black Lives Matter movement, uh, where is that? First is, there we go, Black Lives Matter is. 
Um, go down, I'm gonna go, oops, I'm gonna go to the next page. All right, now I've got civil protest formed the backbone of the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. I've got civil protest formed, and I'll just pick up this one since we're here. Recognizing the importance of protest through American history, this court has afforded sweeping protection. So uh, this court afforded. All right, what I want when I look at the paragraph level, and I don't wanna go, go beyond that, those first sentences to start with, these paragraph thesis sentences, they should tell my story. That's what I want, they tell the story. Um, we want the paragraph thesis sentences to work together to help the reader track through the thought process of the writer to convey what the writer's trying to get across. Almost like an outline unto themselves. So if the writer's looking at uh, the thesis sentences alone and thinking, eh, do I wanna read this paragraph? There's a lot of gray there. I don't know how interested I am. Can I get the thesis sentences and see what this is about? The story of the United States is a story of dissent. In recognition of its historical and social importance, this court has consistently found the right to petition. All right, I'm gonna try, I'm trying to slide down, but it doesn't want to. Here we go. Um, there we go. Social movements throughout history have used assembly. Black Lives Matters is a 21st century embodiment. Civil protests formed the backbone of the civil rights and recognizing this importance, this court has afforded protection. I think that tells a story, does it not? Look at that again. The story of the United States is of dissent. This court has consistently found petition important. Social movements have used assembly. Black Lives Matter is the 21st century embodiment. Civil protest was the backbone of the 60s. The importance uh, of this recognize the court affords protection. I mean, that sort of tells a story. It says, look, uh, from the top, this is the story of the United States. Remember that broad level we start at? We're gonna narrow it. This court has found petition important. Social movements use assembly. And we get to the most specific because D.R.A. McKesson is part of it. Black Lives Matter is the 21st century embodiment of tradition. The civil protests, we find, we give a little background, the civil protest movement of the 50s and 60s. And that, that again, in, in the end of this part A, is backing that out to a slightly broader level of abstraction. And then pip, part B picks up right on top of that social, uh, rather civil protest movement of 50s and 60s. And here we have importance of protest through American history leading to this court has afforded protection. And we know that this section B is going to be about that court protection. And so we have a nice symmetry going on. All right, let me back up here. All right, so I'm going actually to pause for just a moment. Okay, I'm sorry about that. We had a doorbell ring. These are the things that happen when you work from home. So uh, let's go into the paragraph level a little more deeply. Now, instead of looking at how that thesis sentence relates to the paragraph in its superstructure, let's see if the thesis sentence is working for the paragraph. What we want is that thesis sentence should not only fit into that superstructure, but it also should describe that paragraph. So the structure we're looking for is, our thesis sentence says the paragraph is about this. And then within the paragraph, we want to show that progression from A to B. So this paragraph is about A, B, and, and the thesis sentence tells us that. The sentences within the paragraph then demonstrate that development. And so we usually are gonna end up in a place that bears some resemblance to the thesis sentence, just as we started in a place that kicked off with the thesis sentence. So here we have the story of the United States as a story of dissent, and the very next word, born, right? So that's it, we're telling a story. Guess where stories start? With birth. 
right? Ours is the story of countless number of Americans. So we're progressing through the paragraph. And then we want to look at where's that paragraph end? Civil protest has been the vehicle for American values, right? So again, we're talking about the story. And now notice the tense. Civil protest uh, has been. This is a present perfect tense. And so we brought it up to the present where we're saying up to now, what has been, right? And that's going to lead us really nicely into an argument about right now. All right, so let's look at the next one in recognition of this importance. This court has found the right to petition central to a democratic society, all right? And then back it, back it up. D. Ray McKesson, all right? So we're talking about a broad sentence. It's this A, B, and now A, you know what, D. Ray McKesson, like so many others before him, Right, we've got that link to the history. Here we go, we're going to progress. D. Ray McKesson is part of this story. Let's see where the progression and the story go. On to the next page, let's look at the end of that graph. This decision by a divided panel undermines decades of Supreme Court precedent. So McKesson has got a raw deal. That's where this paragraph goes. Um, let me remind you of the thesis sentence is that this court has consistently found central to a democratic society, not for D. Ray McKesson, and therefore there is a threat to future civil demonstration. There is a little bit of a shift there. That's that kind of classic, uh, but, um, but you're not doing it. And so there's a problem that has to be addressed, which is a nice intro to part A. Because remember from our last video that the overall purpose of this, of this section above part A is to uh, narrow, narrow from policy to the case, D. Ray. All right, um, now we get into A. Social movements throughout our history have used assembly and demonstration to effect change, right? We go through the story of that from uh, the colonists, the British colonists, and we come to anti-war protesters throughout our history. So we've got a, a little, this is a short history of social movements effecting change. Right now, the next paragraph, Black Lives Matter's movements is the 21st century. I wanna see this paragraph be all about Black Lives Matter. How does Black Lives Matter show us this uh, principle? And indeed, we'll see it began, right? Just as it were born, this is the story of Black Lives Matter. It is born, it grows, um, it furthers these goals, and now what is it currently experiencing, right? From past to present, the story of Black Lives Matter. Um, and Black Lives Matter, right there in the last sentence, picking up, again, that A to B, uh, that A to B arc. Now we go to the next paragraph. Civil protest formed the backbone of the civil rights movements in the 50s and 60s, right? Okay. Now, I, you know, logically, I think you could make a case that this paragraph should have been up above, that these two paragraphs should be swapped. Um, but I think what they're doing, again, what the writers are trying to do is they're trying to set this up for part B. And so um, it, it is okay, uh, for example, to have a little bit of something here at the end, here at the end of a paragraph that sort of baits the appetite, whets the appetite for what's, what's about to happen. But you want to be careful. You don't want this paragraph's, this paragraph's thesis sentence up here. That would be bad. This paragraph needs its own thesis sentence. But if you have a little bit that, that baits the appetite, all right, racial tension and violence, civil protest for it. No, that works. And likewise, in the bigger structure, this paragraph is baiting the appetite for the next part B. I get it in there, part B, okay? All right, so uh, civil protests formed the backbone of civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. We go back, where, where else? Martin Luther King, um, quoting Dr. King. Dr. King reminded the nation, and the court needs to reaffirm this commitment. Now, we're right back up to the present, right? From 1950s to the present. So again, we have an arc. It was promised by the thesis sentence and the paragraph delivered. 
recognizing the importance of protest in American history, this court has afforded protection. And where does it go but 1919, the origin of modern First Amendment jurisprudence. And look at these dates. It's going to take us forward up to the present day. Okay, so uh, these are really well done. This is kind of what we want to see. Let's have a look uh, for a moment at something that's probably not as well done because it had my hand on it. Um, I'm just going to pull up a section here. I'm joking. I hope it's decent. Um, and if my co-author had anything to do with about it, it's, it's decent. But let's just jump into some part here. Uh, here, let's take this. Just just see if this works. Uh, this is about. Pro this is about. Let me change to. Oh, sorry. I need my comment tools. There we are. All right. This is about privacy and student images. Just a hair larger. I'm trying to get two pages at once here, so I can only make it, but so big. But privacy and student images. Initial confusion stems from understanding regarding what a record is under FERPA. But the foremost goal of FERPA is protection of educational privacy. By default, subject to opt out, FOIA excludes from its scope mundane data. As these definitions suggest, FERPA should not halt student directories, athletic rosters, etc. Okay, so again, are we telling a story? The superstructure, does it fit into privacy and student images as in the superstructure? Sure, initial confusion stems from misunderstandings about the definition of a record. FOIA protects educational records. That's what the definition is. Subject to opt out, excluded is directory information for a purpose not designed to halt directory information, right? So just reading the thesis sentences, I'm telling a story. Now we get into the paragraphs, do they do what they're supposed to? Initial confusion from misunderstanding about what FERPA does. Uh, here's a little bit about what FERPA does. It ends at biometric data uh, are included. All right, so this is mostly definitional. It's not uh, the most artful uh, prose, but it gets the job done. The foremost goal of FERPA is educational privacy. That's the definitional sine qua non, right? So from there, where do we go? The paragraph ends with, even FPCO expert guidance is modeled on this point, as discussed below. So we're saying, yeah, you know what? It's not so clear um, that, that's what, that it's doing what it's supposed to do. And guess what? We're gonna tell you more about it. Not, not a thesis sentence for the next paragraph, but a promise of what's coming up. By default, FERPA expressly excludes directory information. Let's tell you a little bit about that. The DOE, by the way, says that includes photographs. Okay, so we have an evolution about that concept. The definitions suggest FERPA is not designed to halt publication of student directories. Okay, let's talk about those things a little bit. Directories and student basic data. Where do we wind up? Uh, images captured by third parties are not records of educational institution, are not covered by FERPA. So again, we tell, tell the story, we fulfill the arc. So at the superstructure level, looking up from the thesis sentence of the paragraph, we wanna make sure that it's doing its job within the superstructure. Then looking within the paragraph, we wanna make sure that everything in this paragraph is, is dictated by that thesis sentence and consistent with it. And we have a thesis sentence that then plays out through the arc of the paragraph in a progressive way to sum up what the thesis sentence promised. And that's looking at our work at a paragraph level. When we come back, we're going to dive into sentences. I know you're excited. See you soon.